New York, New York, it's a hell of a auto show town. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Henkel, excellence is our passion. This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy, episode 281 for April 2nd of 2015. Maximum luxury at the Big Apple Auto Show. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific or 19 hours GMT. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. While we've taken AutoLine on the road, we're at the New York Auto Show my co-host, Gary Vasilash, should be here, but dang it, he came down with some sort of bug. But no worries, because we got Michelle Krebs here from Auto Trader, filling in as my co-host today. And Michelle, great having you here. Happy to be here. Should also mention that later in the show, we're going to have Joe Filippi, the uh, consultant and forecaster and analyst with Auto Trends Consulting. And we're going to have Jamie Kitman from Automobile Magazine. But right now, I have to introduce our special guest, Pierre Luan, the head of product planning for Nissan in the Americas. And Pierre, great having you on the show. Thank you very much. Very honored to be with you today. So, of course, there's one car we absolutely have to talk about because you're debuting the new Maxima at the New York Auto Show. And what a styling statement this car makes. Tell us a little bit about what you guys hope to achieve with this. Maxima is a very important vehicle for us. It's probably our I mean, best nameplate. <clears throat> We've sold it continuously. It's the longest continuously sold nameplate for Nissan in, in the U.S. since 1981. It's now the eighth generation, so very, very strong for us, very, very important. With the new generation Maxima, we wanted to do three things. Exterior design, we previewed it with the uh, sports sedan concept. The, the final vehicle is very close to that concept car. It was about performance, but fuel economy, 300 horsepower, 15% fuel economy improvement, and interior, craftsmanship, attention to detail, because Maxima is one of those cars which cross shops somehow with luxury, despite Nissan being a non-luxury brand. Is there a technology story? We haven't seen all the details of it, so maybe you could share uh, some of the technology that's in it? There's technology, I mean, the powertrain is, I would say, is a 2.0 version. It's V6 3.5, like previous generation, 61% of the parts are different. The uh, transmission is the Gen 3 Xtronic. So all of this CVT, continuously variable Absolutely, transmission. Absolutely, with D step, which replicates somehow the uh, the way of uh, working of a of a conventional AT. So this contributes to on the one hand 300 horsepower, on the other hand 15 percent better fuel economy, weights reduced by 80 pounds. Uh, in terms of safety, uh, the car adopts the full suite of what we call the safety shield, with of course blind spot warning forward collision warning, but also something, a feature we've introduced on Murano, which we call predictive forward collision warning, sorry for the acronyms, but which through radar monitors not only the car that's immediately in front of you, but the car ahead of that one. It bounces the signal under the car in exactly, front of you, Exactly, right? you have sonar radar uh, going under the car that's immediately in front of you to predict what's happening ahead, one car ahead, so that you have more time to react. Talk a little bit more about the styling, because there's a, a a tremendous resemblance between the Maxima and the new Murano as well. A really good family resemblance there. Yeah, absolutely. Designers wanted to give a family resemblance at least to those two cars, which are close again to those two cars cross shop with, I mean, to some extent, 10, 15 percent with the luxury brands. And family resemblance is the V shaped grille but he's also the floating roof, uh, the character line on the side. That, that little kick up in uh, the rear three quarter panel too. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Maxima is a very interesting example. I mean, uh, the first review, the first design review we had at the very beginning of the process, early 2012, when typically we look at quarter scale models, we had six or seven, I don't remember exactly. One immediately captured everybody's attention. It was like, yeah, we want this one, which is rare. Because usually in that type of situation, you have, uh, we'd like the front of this one, the rear of this one, the side of this one. On that day, we had a quarter scale model. We selected three, because that's the process. You go, go with three, go with two, go with one. The one that was selected is in fact very close to the car that you see today uh, in production. 
I have to ask you, this, this is a full-size car. That market has not been very strong. In fact, it's been shrinking. So why are you so optimistic about the Maxima in this segment? I'm very optimistic because I don't believe in the, uh, the segment classification for this type of vehicle. Okay. I mean, if, yeah, you look at that segment, the way manufacturers define it or analysts define it, it's, it's relatively stable, 600 to 650,000 a year. But it's extremely volatile inside. Uh, what you see is somebody brings a new car which somehow resonates with consumers, it's a hit. What, what, with Maxima, if you look at the past, we've sold, depending upon the years, between 50 and 80,000 a year. So it's not marginal, it, it's quite a big, uh, big, big score. Again, reputation of the brand is very strong. I mean, I'll have to give you an anecdote. Being a foreigner, every time I get back into the country, I go through kind of a rigorous process. Uh, where, I mean, who are you? What do you do? When I tell the CBP officer I work for Nissan and I'm in product planning, I'd say, and I'm not joking you, every second or third time, they spontaneously mention Maxima. My sister has one. When do you bring the next one? So it, it's that big of a nameplate for us. Right. So, uh, we believe the, the combination of this design, the performance, the way the car drives, because it drives really well, uh, and the attention to detail inside will make it a success. You can never say it's guaranteed, you need to be humble in this business, but it's close to being guaranteed, I believe. And I have to ask you, we got a little sneak peek of this in the Super Bowl, the ad, the famous dad ad that really captured the hearts of a lot of people. How did that come about that you decided to put that in the ad? And you didn't say it was the Maxima. We didn't say it, it was written. So if you were able to stop, uh, it was written. The, the car was badged. Uh, I mean, the story of the Super Bowl is, it started a year before under Fred Diaz's uh, leadership. Fred thought, and us, I mean, everybody agreed that we should come back and I mean, say something, say that, yeah, we're, we're a big player in the US. So it's, it's I mean, incredible for us to be at the Super Bowl. And then uh, the Super Bowl is, I mean, when you do those commercials, it's about telling a story. And that's, I mean, and I was told you either make people laugh or cry. We chose our camp. Uh, but we wanted to make it special by unveiling a couple of things. And in fact, we unveiled two vehicles. One was the Maxima at the very end. The other one was the Le Mans car, which had not been seen before. And that, I mean, the story was about all of this which, yeah, created a lot of buzz. You know the result. The right. Super Bowl ad won the Google uh, contest. Uh, it was a uh, top 10 ads uh, for, I mean, with USA Today immediately after the Super Bowl. So it, I think we have at this stage 22.5 million views. It was a, a really, really big success for us. What does the Maxima say about where you're going with the rest of the Nissan line? The Maxima tells, um, in my view, the Maxima tells a story about where we're going in North America. It's, it's at first a car for North America, and in fact, at first a car for the US. The, the overall volume, we sell 90% in North America, and out of those 90%, another probably 90% in the US, and the 10% remaining is uh, Gulf countries, Emirates. So it, it's a car for the US. Uh, what it says is, uh, it, it resonates, in my view, with our uh, kind of uh, brand caption, innovation that excites. There's a lot of innovation in this vehicle for safety, for performance, weight reduction, and it's certainly exciting to drive, really exciting to drive. You know what I'm so impressed about, and I've said this before, is that Nissan has really stuck to using CVTs. You've really made them work. I'm blown away that it's in the Murano, a big vehicle, a heavy vehicle, all-wheel drive vehicle, and now the same thing in an all uh, in a full-size sedan. My question is, what's the public's reaction? Are they even aware of it, especially as you mentioned that you've got this sort of simulated step shifting to it, or, or not at all? I believe that now that CVT has improved over generations, and you see other competitors coming to CVT, I mean, Asians in particular, uh, and that we've been able to tune those CV to, to retain the biggest advantage of a CVT, which is the, the opening, which gives you the fuel economy somehow and the lack of friction, but mimic somehow and in some circumstances when you, when you are 50% um, on the accelerator pedal, pedal and, and beyond, mimic a, a step automatic transmission with some G feel. I think the, the consumer does not care if it's a CVT. It's a two pedal vehicle. Think they don't care. And on Maxima, 
at least on the SR version, so the sportier with the 19-inch wheels. We also have paddle shift, so you can use the transmission as a almost as a manual transmission or a dual clutch. Mm -hmm. It's. Uh, I, I think you're leading the way. I think we're going to see a whole lot more CVTs coming up in the near future, too. But we're, we're clearly, I mean, we are in a strong, uh, uh, I mean, we, we use CVT in quite a lot of our vehicles from the very small ones up to, as you said, the, the Murano, the Pathfinder. We have a very strong partnership with Jatco. Uh, and the CVTs give us the scores and the, and the results that we have in fuel economy. I mean, remember Nissan was ranked uh, the, the, the brand with the best fuel efficiency for those brands with a full lineup of, of cars. So, yeah, I mean, we're, we have CVTs, we have a long experience with CVTs, and we're gonna keep using those CVTs for uh, the, the, the years to come. Speaking, you, speaking of fuel economy, you haven't said any numbers. Are you sharing those yet? Uh, I mean, yeah, I can. I mean, again, performance 300 horsepower, fuel economy improved by 15%, which gives you, uh, f forgive me, I forgot the different numbers, but the highway is uh, 30 miles per gallon. Not That's bad. pretty good. Gary, you've got the Nissan LEAF, so you're able to get ZEV credits that way, but are you looking to add hybrids or plug-ins to the rest of the lineup, such as the, the new Maxima? Maxima, maybe not, certainly not in the, in the near future. Yeah, we, we have, and we have been working on hybrids. We're working on plug-in hybrids. We're working on other different other technologies. We have a Pathfinder hybrid. We have a in the Infinity lineup with a QX60 hybrid, and we will introduce more hybrids as time goes by, either in crossovers or potentially in sedans in the future. Mm -hmm. So, what's next up after Maxima? Well, after Maxima, I mean, this year for us, two very big events: Maxima but also Titan behind us. Mm -hmm. Titan was unveiled in Detroit. In fact, we're gonna launch Maxima commercially uh, early summer. Titan will come later this year. Very big event for us. I mean, we have a Titan today. We do uh, low volumes because the, the vehicle is quite old. It's quite old because for a long time, and there were several projects to replace it. One of them was Chrysler that didn't materialize. We believe we also have a very strong product with the two different chassis, with a full lineup, contrary to the, 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 the current Titan, where we have only one engine, it's only two bodies. Uh, that's a very difficult segment, because domestics do a great job. But somehow, uh, we have proven to ourselves in the very first years of Titan, of current generation, the, ver the first two years, we almost reached 100,000, so 4% market share. And uh, our major Japanese competitor shows us that it's possible to sell a truck when you're Japanese, say between 100 and 200,000 uh, trucks a year. Where do you think the potential is for that? Where are you going to squeeze in amongst the, the domestics or certain markets? Uh... Yeah, I mean, we haven't... I, if we were to get to probably around 5% segment share, I think that's, that's, that's what we could do. We've done it before. Uh, that's, that's, what we're, that's what we could do. Pierre, Carlos Ghosn has set the goal of Nissan in the U.S. achieving 10% market share. Uh, I haven't seen the March numbers yet, but I know the month before you were about 9.1%, I think. But as a product planner, my question is, do you have the vehicles in the lineup you need to hit that 10% goal? I better have them because uh, that's, that's the <laughs> no, but I, I guess what I'm fishing for is, do you see others? <laughs> any holes in there? Yeah, any well, holes in the lineup. Here. Clearly, I mean, we, we talked about Titan. That's one of them. I mean, we do, I mean, today we do less than 15,000 Titans a year. The segment's 2 million vehicles. Uh, we, we need to do much better. That's one. Second one, which was identified, was Sentra. Uh, Sentra, when you look at our major competitors, they used to outsell us three to one, roughly. Uh, it's now three to two. There's nothing to be really proud of, but it's, but it's you're already closing the much better. Yeah. Uh, so once you close these two and you get to where the Nissan brand should be compared to those two major Japanese competitors, you're getting close. After that, yeah, we still have a few things, but stay tuned. <laughs> you seem to be bucking the trend of, a lot of companies have struggled on the, the small car side, but it seems like Nissan is posting increase after increase of Sentra, Versa. What are you doing there that's... Yeah, I mean, Sentra, we've worked consistently to improve the product, 
every model year we've improved the product since we've launched the, the new generation. The uh, capacity as well, as you know, we opened the second uh, factory in uh, Aguas Calientes. So I think the combination of this and, and we keep working on Centra. Uh, on, on a smaller car, so on Versa, Versa Note, Versa Sedan is kind of a unique proposition on, on the US market with a, a very aggressive entry price but very little incentive, so it, it's, it's sustainable for us and we do very well. And Versa Note is, uh, gives you a combination of affordable price plus a lot of space, a lot of utility. And in fact, the Versa combined is the leader in the entry segment. Mm -hmm. so that works. And then there's Rogue and Altima. And, and Rogue, I mean, is, I mean this segment sense. is booming. Yes. As you know, Rogue is, a, is very strong. Uh, Rogue, we, our, our only issue, I would say, is capacity, industrial capacity. We have, uh, we produce it in Smyrna. We have now complementary production from Korea, and this will increase. Pierre Luant, it's been great having you here on AutoLine After Hours. Real interesting to see what Nissan's doing, especially with that new Maxima. I can't wait to get a chance to drive all that. But with that, we're going to have to close up this segment. I want to thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, Rose. Thank, thank you, John. Stay with us. Coming up next, we're going to have Michelle still here, Jamie Kitman, Joe Filippi. We're going to be talking about all the new things that we thought that was the best stuff at the New York show. And we'll be back right after this. You already know that you can listen to AutoLine's Industry Insight in places like YouTube and Stitcher. But did you know that you can also listen to it live in your car? It's simple. Just pair your smartphone with your vehicle's Bluetooth connection or plug into the aux jack. Then navigate to Autoline.tv using your phone's browser. Find the show you want to hear and click play just like you would on your computer. This is Autoline After Hours with John McElroy. It's that easy. Never be disconnected from Autoline's top-notch insider information with Autoline on the go. Back at the New York Auto Show, joined now by Jamie Kitman from Automobile Magazine, Joe Filippi from Auto Trends Consulting. Good having the both of you here. Thank you, John. So, Jamie, let's just throw this out. What do you like at the show here? Pick, pick one, and then we'll get to the rest of it all. Uh, I'm intrigued by the CT6 Cadillac. I think it's uh, why, why. Well, I think it's it's an important um, technological statement, and I think it's. It's sort of it's it's definitely going against the headwinds. It seems like that Cadillac faces and people who build cars face in a world where, if certainly if you're in the luxury end, all the money seems to be spilling into SUVs and things like that. So to actually try to engineer a, a brand new rear-wheel drive car, um, and uh, you know, with a lot of interesting technology, it's, uh, it's exciting. I don't know how it'll do. You know, it could be a real disappointment, but I think. You know, it makes me kind of, you know, not to sound ridiculous, but as an American, it makes me sort of proud in a patriotic way that Cadillac is is taking the fight to them. You know, I don't know if they win. Yeah. Joe, your reactions to John, the CT6. I'd echo Jamie's comments. Uh, you know, if you look at the cutaway version that's available on the floor, you see a tremendous amount of really interesting technology, very large, high-pressure aluminum castings, uh, the all aluminum skin, that's a, that's like a first for a major American car company. A lot of interesting technologies went into it. I think there's several miles, if not far greater than that, of, of industrial anaerobic type adhesives that kind of glue this car together. Uh, exotic rivets, so they're throwing in a huge amount of technology to take weight out of the car. Yeah, and I, I want to come back to that in a minute, but I want to get Michelle's reaction well, to the car. Oh, well, um... And to me, it was a kind of a predictable evolution of their design language. There were some differences, a little bit rounded, uh, you know, front, but still a lot of edgy lines, and, the, and then the more rounded back. So I wasn't like blown away, shocked at what it looked like, because I sort of knew what to expect. And and loading a car with technology and comfort and all the features has not been Cadillac's problem. It's all about building the brand, and it's going to have to keep just producing products over and over that are great. Right. I mean, it was telling that if you were to evaluate like the amount of buzz things were getting in advance of the show, the, the Lincoln Continental was, you know, def the definite buzz victor. Um, 
and I think it was partly because of the name, but mostly maybe because of the name, because on a, on a technology level, way less interesting car, and on a style level, not, you know, great, you know, oh, all right, you know, some interesting spots, much of which, you know, the interior is probably the best part of that car, I thought, um, but mu much of that may not really see its way into production, so. So kind of, kind of hard to say. I thought that was. I think the Lincoln's a really interesting car, and I think there's a lot we don't know about it because we're seeing a concept version and the production versions a ways away. Um, to me, what it said is Lincoln's serious about uh, being luxury because there's been so many rumors around. Eh, are they really committed to the luxury market? Are they really committed to the Lincoln brand? To me, it said they are. Yeah, and I think one of the ways of measuring that commitment is. Uh, the fact that Mark Fields, the CEO of the company, was doing so much of the presentation. They brought in a lot of the heavy artillery executive-wise, and I think it was to convey that very message that you're raising. How serious are they with right. this brand? I mean, they, they are investing about two and a half plus billion, the last time I checked, you know, in this whole portfolio, and we've got additional vehicles coming out over the next three or four years to flesh out that portfolio. That, that's the first I've heard this. They said they've got two more vehicles that they're going to add to the lineup. Right. Vehicles that they don't have is, now at all. So it, they're not replacing something. Is that, are they meant to come out of that two and a half billion investment? I hope not. It, that's not that, enough. Right? Not, that's what you're getting at, right? Yeah. Exactly. It'll, it'll be that and more. No, you know, because, because Cadillac's making a bigger investment. They're right. talking about eight and, vehicles until 20. And I think if, if you compare those cars in terms of their technology, you know, the Continental is, is derived really from the Fusion platform. It, it was a front drive, you know, chassis that they're working with, an existing one. And there's, there's some stuff about it that certainly is cool technologically and design-wise. But um, And I agree that the Cadillac maybe is not the home run that it needs to be from style-wise, but in terms of like serious technology and going up against the Germans and the Japanese, the Cadillac is, you know, is, is really heads above the Lincoln, I think. But, but we're I, seeing uh, a concept I'm, version that's, that we haven't really even, they are not really talking about a lot of the technology. Well, that's because, the and there's a reason for that. Well, um, they're going to... I poked and prodded as many I people know. as I could, you know, wheelbase, powertrain, right. front right. drive, rear drive, all-wheel drive. I, they're going to the do a dance of the seven, seven veils. We're going to see this as in now typical this car, Ford stat. This car comes out in the fall of 16. So th this car's locked in. They're not telling us what they. They're not telling us in, exactly because that's not the Ford in. way. We have to roll it out, well, you know, a little bit. Think about time. think about the new Ford GT though. I mean, that is everybody knows everything there is to know about that. That's a really exciting car, but they're talking a lot about the technology. So I don't think it's part of some brilliant marketing strategy. I think that it's it still is a half-hearted effort. Uh, you know, it's better than they've been doing, but still wanting in, in my view. We'll I want to go back to the CT6 a minute because I like the styling. I, I think, you know, it's it's hard to judge a car in an auto shop it when is. it's up on a pedestal right. and the yeah, lighting's weird yeah, yeah. and all that. Special paint. I think if you see that thing come around the corner here in New York and just sort of emerge and pull up to a high-end hotel, it's going to look right at home. I think it's got road presence. But I only think that. i got to see it on the road to be for right. sure you, about you that. You lose a little something with the white car. Right? You do. Yeah. Show me one yeah. of the really great-looking metallic colors. And the other thing is that they're sort of softening that yes. art and science, hard edge. And I think the next car, the bigger car, the big car, the S-Class competitor, is probably going to show those corners and edges around it off even to an even greater degree. But I want to go back to what you raised, Joe, because you know when I saw the CT6, I, I think it's a good car. I think it's got good road presence. But until I saw the cutaway of the car that really shows a lot of the engineering under the skin, I didn't appreciate what they had done. And they're doing stuff I have seen no other car company yet on the planet do. So there's, and it's more than an engineering story. It's a manufacturing story. Right. They're doing manufacturing techniques that no one's gotten yeah. to yet. Right. And so, you know, wow, is this the real revival of General Motors that it's not just throwing some nice sheet metal over something that they're trying to drag out the tooling costs on amortizing it. They're doing significant engineering, manufacturing engineering, I haven't seen anybody do before. Well, and, and if we can believe what they're saying, a lot of this stuff is only going to be resident in Cadillac. It's going to be very, very exclusive to Cadillac. So it's not going to spread to, let's say, to Buick or bigger Chevys or something like that. Some of those lessons will. 
Well, you know, some of the joining techniques, right, this, sure. this laser welding that they're doing with aluminum that I guess they've got something special on, I think that will migrate to other well, lines. Yeah. Also, a new rear drive chassis is a big deal, and that's something that, you know, I would have liked to have think that some, something that Ford would have wanted to do for a new Continental. But it also, it all kind of speaks to a, um, a, a rebirth of the large American car, which, uh, you know, I used to be, you know, strongly opposed to large American cars when they got 11 miles per gallon and, and handled horribly. Um, now, you know, with the weight savings and, and the engine management and the smaller displacement engines, you know, I think they're really viable alternatives. And it, it's, it's kind of delightful in a world where, the, you know, everything is just a new crossover to see somebody you know, throw some, you know, uh, put an ore in in that area, you know. And the base engine is a four-cylinder turbo yeah. right. in this right. great big Cadillac. So, and we know, to, to your point, Jamie, is there's a plug-in version of this Cadillac CT6 coming, and I think they're talking about a blended 70 miles per gallon with that. So even yeah. more impressive that here you got a big American sedan that's Right. Pretty efficient. I think people could be persuaded to buy them. I think that you know, if we learned anything in the last 30 years of since Cafe started, is people. You know, there are a lot of people just they want a big car, and if it had to be a truck, it was going to be a truck. But if there's really a, a big car option, that could be a great thing for the and, American maker. Let's remember, it's not just about America. This, both of right. those cars scream China to me. I mean, these are, I think they'll probably do better in China than maybe well, in the Well, a Cadillac person told me that they hope to sell 45% of CT6s in China. Well, so. they're going to assemble them there, so. Wow. And, and, uh, yeah, uh, this car, this new car will be assembled in right, China from, right. like, the get-go. Right. Which is... Well, you have to, right? Otherwise, right. you get slapped right. with this 25% oh, yeah. import tariff. Any. But that's a big step. That's yes. it is. multi-hundred million dollars of investment. Right. You know, in another new body Which Lincoln's going to have to do if it's, I mean, it's saying that that's a car for China. We need to hear about the uh, manufacturing of it there, too. Otherwise okay, I know they, we could talk more about yeah. Lincoln and Cadillac and the <laughs> CT6. They're the only and, ones and, in the show. Yeah, what, <laughs> else? That one to what else did you guys like, Joe? Well, the new Malibu. It's, you know, yes. Lighter, longer, more room inside, very, you know, good, lots of knee room and foot room. Nicely styled. And Very nicely and styled. Speaking of the styling, did you guys meet the, the chief stylist or the guy that, that took the sketch I, from? I know He's you had a 25 years old. So, an interesting story, they said they had all the design staff come on, put s sketches on the wall, and this kid walks in, sees everything that's going on, sits down, scribbles something out, puts it up, and they go, that's it. So, look, this is great news because I love seeing young new talent come into this industry. And uh, I'll tell you, GM Design, they, they think this kid could be a rock star. We'll see what happens. Sometimes that can be the kiss of death. Mm -hmm. But right. it's cool that they went with a sketch from a 25-year-old. And, yeah. and also, the, the interior is just way ramped Absolutely up. Absolutely I mean, it, that car, To me, that car looks like a much more expensive car than it, we expect it will be. Yeah. It looks like um, an Audi from some yeah. angles. Like the A6, nice. right? Yeah, With that and the, in the rear. Yeah, and the, and or, the or rear. A7, like excuse that. me. There's yeah, a the touch A7. of that. I see a little A4 too in it, but um, it, it, the whole show, one takeaway for me is that many years previous, I, I've gone like everybody's copying BMW, and now it's clear that everybody's copying Audi, you know. And, and they, they push the interim panel level down and forward, so you get you know, much better visual looking over the hood. You know what really caught my eye? They have the name Malibu on the front doors. In individual you know, letters. In individual letters. I've never ever seen that done, hmm. uh, you know, not in the modern era. Uh, and so it's it's interesting to me. Some people said that I asked about it. They said oh, they, they didn't like that approach. But somehow it just, it's got a California look to me somehow. With, with the name Malibu, it should. Mm -hmm. yeah, good point. Okay, what else? Well, the Civic, and it's a little bit disguised as, a, you know, much the concept car, but, you know, Honda, that was the heart and soul of Honda and engineering expertise, so I would love to see them get their mojo back on that regard. It's not encouraging when I heard them saying, and this time it's going to be bigger, because it's well, been bigger every time, and right. at a certain point, it's not a Civic anymore, it's an Accord, and I don't even know what an Accord becomes then. But remember, they have the fit that comes up 
underneath. Everybody's moved up because of the smaller cars coming in underneath. Right, and and, and the little coupe that's uh, you know if it if it handles like the the old ones did and do, that can make it a real hit. Well, I think it's kind of significant though that you know they've chosen the New York show to to exhibit this car, and you know uh, the last generation fell flat on its face in the eyes of the automotive media. Sales didn't do half bad, but even though they sold them, I, I'm not sure that it really helped the Honda brand. So my question will be, does this new one not only get us really right. raving yeah. about it, but does it really solidify the Honda brand for that Bring segment? Bring back the magic. Yeah. Well, they, they said that they were going to be selling the Type R, or they all but said that they'll sell the Type R here for the first time. So that's... Uh, pretty exciting, I, I would think, if you're a Honda guy. Michelle, what else do you uh, like here well, at the show? Th that covers the highlights for me, and, you know, I'm anxious to see the Maxima. Again, we've seen, you know, Mercedes has another SUV, and... Uh, well, what do you think of that? You know, they've had the M-Class, or then it became ML, and now it's the GLE. I'm confused, but maybe <laughs> Mercedes buyers aren't. I don't know. People ask me that, do you, you know, is all that, and, and we see this, the same thing with Infinity changing all the names, and now Cadillac's ch changing all the names. It's well, I had lunch recently with a very game Mercedes PR guy, and he spent, you know, we had, we chatted amiably about everything but cars for a long time, and then he's like, I, I have to walk you through the new naming strategy. And we were there for another 40 minutes. We had like four cups of coffee before he could even explain it, and then I was confused anyway, but I think he understood it, so it can be done. I think the one significant thing about this GL, GLE, right, is it's the first plug-in from Mercedes, and now they're going to have a whole string of them, but Jamie, I'll start with you first. Our, mm -hmm. our plug-in's going to sell. So far, it's it hasn't worked. Um, I think the less of a price penalty there is, uh, the, more, the more they'll sell. I think, you know, it'll be interesting, it'll be interesting to see when, when people really, when a company really puts marketing muscle behind selling those things. You know, they'll, they'll release them, they'll announce them, they'll maybe they'll talk about them, but they really haven't tried very hard so far, I don't think, to sell plug-ins and, and hybrids generally. They're not, you know, there's the Prius, which is sort of sui generis, but, um, but beyond that, we'll see. I mean, I think in the case of a, of a larger vehicle that probably gets, you know, ordinary mileage, if you can have some wild number, well, like in the case of the Malibu, 46 miles per gallon city, that sounds pretty great. And a lot of people, and certainly in that market, are, are very cost, running cost sensitive. Um, in the bigger cars, probably not so much, but I think it's a way for people who might have some lingering guilt about driving something so hulking um, to assuage that guilt. But, but having hybrids across you know, the vast portion of your range, takes a lot, away a lot of the sort of the guilt feelings that luxury car buyers or certain categories of luxury car buyers might have about spending a lot of money on a, on a big car that doesn't get Do you very, think they have that? Economy. Pardon? <laughs> Do you think they have that? When I look at the, the sales, sales came out today and, you know, big utilities that now granted they don't guzzle the gas that they used to, but I don't seem to think that there's much guilt or concern about fuel economy, especially at the price of gas right now. I think I think there's a portion of the market that's been this way. And actually, I was talking to Joe, I'm sort of hatching this theory lately about what happened to, uh, what you know, what happened to Volkswagen and Volvo and, and, and what happened to Subaru being somewhat slightly related. There was a class of, of reasonably affluent to very affluent person who always wanted a car that just said, here's a car, it's simple, it's, um, there's no pretense, and I get good gas mileage. And that was kind of you know, a defining value of Volvo owners and, and Volkswagen owners in the 60s and the 70s. And they, they kind of got away from that uh, a, a, a bit. And um, I think that um, Subaru has profited from that. It's paradoxical because their cars just get bigger and bigger and bigger, but they get better and better gas mileage. So it's almost like they, they, they've held on to that same ethos. And I think Volkswagen and Volvo would both do well to go back and get those people. And you see efforts to do that, you know, um, the e-golf the e that's here at the show and the various diesels that they have, Volvo with their, their e-drive engines, which are, are really fuel efficient, finally. But they're also going to build... Uh, 
a very big SUV. And it'll be very interesting to see what they do since they announced the other day that they're going to be building a plant in the U.S. And it's almost impossible to imagine that they do anything else but go to some right-to-work state in the South and build a large SUV. You know, and yet, you know, I, I, I'm shedding a tiny tear inside because I know that they will have re that will really break faith with what was their core audience and their core values. And and so. I wish they would do something different, you know, and, and a little more creative. But I'm sure when you look at the numbers and the state of Alabama or, or Mississippi Georgia. is Georgia is going like here's a billion dollars in, in abatements and free land uh, that that's hard to avoid. I don't know that a northern state wouldn't do that, but then of course then unions become an issue. But again, for that original core of people, you know, they're not anti-union the same way that other people are. And ironically, I remember reading when I was a kid in 1972 in the uh, uh, presidential election that 80% of Volvo buyers supported uh, McGovern and 100% of Saab drivers in, in, in 1972. <laughs> Whereas now, I recently saw some research that almost every brand is about evenly divided between uh, Republicans and Democrats. Interesting. And uh, except for Mini, which tilt slightly more liberal, um, but you know, then again, their cars are getting bigger and some of them less fuel efficient. And ironically, they weren't even they at the aren't show. Even near, yeah. um, so at the end of the day, we have to go after the independents and yeah. figure out what they want to buy. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Twenty percent of the like electorate. The twenty percent yeah. of the electorate that, <laughs> or, that are truly or, independent. You know, in the way that the whole society of you know, when you're marketing to people, you're you know, listening to radio stations, it's getting more and more f fractionalized. You know, you you maybe you. You go after that, just that group of people who want that thing, and I do feel that those people are being underserved. The, the kind of, um, the green people who are unpretentious, you know, um, and don't, you know, they don't need a Prius, maybe, um, but they want they want a real car. You know uh, what you're saying about Volvo and unions is very interesting because, of course, Volvo pioneered so many uh, workshop labor practices uh, that were. You know, let's integrate the workers with right. the process. Let's not make them just automatons who stand at the station and do repetitive work. And uh, I'll bet you're right. I'll bet they go down south. But I'm it's not a sure. great part of their story, and it's a shame they used to. You know, that was part of the story. And 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 Saturn, when Saturn launched, that was a huge part of their story. It wasn't. You know, it may have been overstated, but it was. It was really General Motors' greatest marketing triumph of the last quarter of the 20th century was Saturn, which was an ordinary car that, you know, and subordinary by the end of, of many of its lines, lives. And yet, um, they told such a good story about it that it brought people who would have been buying Volvos and Volkswagens out to buy it, and they didn't even realize it was a General Motors product, you know? That's right. Yeah. Well, I think that Volvo will probably end up down south, but more likely, not to avoid unions, but it's probably going to want to use the same Side supply base, base that yes. BMW and Mercedes well, have already established, yeah. and you want to be close to your suppliers. So Somewhere along I-75. Yeah. 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 Right, so the, all the product componentry can flow right down. You know, and to your point about the, the market being so many segments, but at the same time, you know, Volvo used to own safety. Well, everybody has to own safety now, and everybody has to have fuel economy. I think it's really getting hard to distinguish your brand. It is, more. although I'll give Volvo credit. You know, they were the first or one of the first, certainly in their price class, with forward collision warning right. with full mm -hmm. stop, pedestrian protection. So as long as you're the first out there, you know, first is with the most is kind mm -hmm. of an approach, the public perception is still that Absolutely. they're the leader. Yeah. So even though everyone else is doing the same thing, as long as you're the first one out there and advertise it, right. you, you can maintain that image. I think, I think the, the, the research shows that people still think Volvo's your safe. Yeah. If you tell somebody in right. 2015, I bought a Volvo, they're like, that's safe. You know, that's a safe mm -hmm. choice. And it may be exactly the same as something else, but you know, so I think they own that and they can build on it. Um, but uh, yeah, theirs is a theirs is a tough, uh, you know, road to hoe. So I had I missed the fact that you guys brought up that Minnie's not at the show. Right. What's that about? Well, um, the, apparently uh, they were uh, offered a really um, crappy spot um, to, to in the north 
pavilion, and they were just like, oh, the hell with it. Um, the um, it was you know it costs like a million dollars to be here. Um, they have no new model that they're introducing. Um, it's been a, it's been sort of a bad year for them, if you were going to say. They the new Mini sold less in its first year than the outgoing model, which was I mean significantly less, which is that's not a good sign. Um, and uh, you know, so I think they decided to husband their resources and and save it save it for later. But uh, they were you know they were supposed to be next to Mitsubishi up and in the Fiat. north and Fiat and Scion. Yeah, and and if they, Fiat and Scion were not happy and. Their parent companies, Toyota and Chrysler, their FCA, um, you know, they they try to leverage it into moving, but it didn't go. And they uh, they just announced that they're going to build the Super Ledger, which would have been a great opportunity here, theoretically. Right, yeah. it was Put part one of the, on the theme BMW of the stand. Yeah. You know, yeah. here it is. This is the concept. Remember this one. Well, now we're going to build it, even if it's just a. Yeah, a quick ten-minute press conference. It's too bad that because that's a cool car. But you know, it, you talk about the North Hall, and isn't that a problem at every single auto yes, show? Everybody is. wants their press conference oh. the first day, and everybody wants the best fo floor yes. space, and it's just not possible to do. Not yes. here. Ask the organizers how hard that is to carve up the space on the floor. I've seen the fights about that. Yeah. It's, oh yeah. I'm well, sure look, you go to that meeting with a switchblade. Oh yeah. Look at the square footage that the the. the really high-end supercar guys have here. You know, the the Lambo stand, the big stand for Maserati. And Aston Martin, Aston Martin has, has a lot huge of space. Aston yeah. Martin, Martin, absolutely. So they, they kind of took it, carved out the entire middle of the It of reminded the me of Geneva a little bit, you know, how yeah. the really exotics right there in the middle. Maybe this negotiations is the same as trying to get the Olympics to your city or the World <laughs> Cup, you know? It's a lot of under the table yeah. bakish or something. Oh, I'll give you this much space if you give me this debut and all well, it, that. It's yeah. interesting because GM regretted from day one having ended up in the North Pole, and they were like so relieved to get back, you know, on the main, main floor. floor. Yeah. Yeah, I, they could tell us, but then they'd have to kill us. Yeah. They really would. So let's see, we've had. Uh, Mercedes we talked about. Uh, BMW didn't do a lot, did they? Oh, there's yeah. the new XF Jaguar. Yeah. And, oh, and Jaguar. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah. Um, which looked pretty good to me. Um, you know, it's all aluminum now, finally, bringing it in line with the rest of their lineup. And uh, uh, it's it's their best-selling uh, sedan here already, so uh, that, that should do nicely for them. Um, what I thought was weird, though, is to me, at first glance, it doesn't look all that different. It's a total new architecture. It's a bigger car, actually, a little bit longer. Uh, a lot of changes under the skin, right. and yet, so, you know, at first blink, it looks like the old one. Yeah, I don't think, you know, I mean, sadly, because I, I actually think they're really nice cars, and if I was in the market for that class of car, I would seriously, I recommend them to people a lot to buy, uh, and they drive them, and they go, wow, this is great, you know, because they, ri they really ride better than anything. Uh, but then they go, well, you know, the reliability is not so good. And, and then you say, well, you know, their J.D. Power numbers are off the charts. They're doing great. And they go, yeah, but, you know, I had a friend who had one, and it was a nightmare. So um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big job for them. And, uh, you know, I, I really would like to see them turn it around. And they certainly, you can't fault them for their product overall. Um, but uh, I, you know, it's just it's just a really hard, it's, hard. It's job. really hard to shake those old. Man, that's a 40, of, 50 year old thing. Uh, yes. Yeah. You know, what but we didn't know, talk about is the Lexus RX. Oh yeah. Which is a hugely important vehicle, and I mean that was the granddaddy of the crossovers, and. Uh, they were the first ones. Yes. I mean, they Toyota I, or Toyota, okay, Lexus identified mm -hmm. that segment and jumped and on it before it. anybody did. They right. Sure and did. still own it. And they still and, and they own it. I'm mean, 25 percent of the market with an incredibly with almost doubling of the competitors. Yeah. In it, that segment. What's it's, there's me. like 17 competitors or something 16 like that. Or 17. Yeah, 16, 17. yeah, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. Still 25 percent. Over 100,000 a year. You know what I like about it is the, uh, it it looks pretty good, unlike the NX, yeah, which to me is because it's shorter. It looks all hunched and I, I don't know. But when you stretch that form language out, it works a whole lot better. Yeah, one car I think that going back to Volkswagen, that I think that is it called the Cross Track. All Track. All Track. All Track. All Track. All Track. All Track. I think that's right. Right. Yeah. I'm embarrassed to say. I, I mean, 
I was at the event, and I can't even remember the name. Uh, <laughs> That's he, not he, a good sign. It was because it was because I, the, I can't either, Jamie. It was so because the dance music was too loud. It, yeah. it, it addled my thinking. But uh, that I think strangely could be a very successful car uh, for them because it really goes right at Subaru and the right. legacy. I think. And it's a, a German alternative. It for, is, for and it's those, it's yes. a good looking car, and it's it's jacked up. Is that the one not, that's got those? Highlighted character lines that go around the wheel wells, yeah, or is that a does, different it one? Does, I don't does. like that look myself. Uh, you know, it's silly, really, but all crossover SUVs are silly. You know, they, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, RX Lexus. I mean, it's a it's a Camry that's got you know bigger, taller springs. You know, I mean, it's really not uh, about going off road, but it's that style. You know, pe people the want it. The public wants it, and, and guess what? It's not just here in the U.S. It's CUVs global. are taking over the industry globally. I know. Yeah, we will be gone. I think before that trend, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, disappears. I had it's that a shame. I had that discussion. Nothing with, would make me happier, but uh, I had that discussion with Cadillac because they're lagging in that. They need. They've got three coming out: an SRX replacement later, and then a smaller and a bigger one. Um, and they're way behind. And I asked that. You know, is the trend going to run out before you get these out? And it doesn't look that way. Hey, look, uh, we got to take a the Chinese market is just getting well, going. Well, there you go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so watch out for the CUV craze over there. Yeah. We're going to take a quick commercial break. we got a whole lot more to talk about, but we're going to be back right after this. A little chemistry goes a long way, especially when it comes to vehicle development. From enabling the use of alternate materials to withstanding extreme vehicle environments, Henkel's adhesive, sealants, and surface technologies provide solutions for every vehicle segment. Come see for yourself. Our Detroit area headquarters offers 12 research and development and testing laboratories with the ability to do full range testing and validation on actual vehicle parts. Sign up to tour our labs at henkelna.com forward slash tour. Welcome back to AutoLine After Hours. All oh, coming to you from the New York Auto Show with Michelle Krebs, Jamie Kipman, and Joe Filippi. And hey, did you guys see this news? Ralph Gilles, the head of design at Chrysler, or I should say F-C-A-U-S-A-L-L-C. <laughs> <laughs> headquartered in uh, the Netherlands. Yeah, yeah, headquartered in the Netherlands. <laughs> yeah, yeah, traded on the London Stock Exchange, I think it is. But uh, hey, Ralph is now going to take over head of design for the entire group. Well, what do you make of this, Michelle? Oh, I think, you know, he's been on the fast track for a long time. And um, I think that's probably a good move. Nothing succeeds like success, you know, and he's, he's been around for what's really been, I mean, we forget, you know, you really have to pinch yourself when you think about how successful FCA has been. And I remember, you know, many, many people who should have known better in 2007 and 8 going like, let it die, you know, there's nothing there, sell Jeep to the Chinese and let's just be done with it. And boy, you know, I mean, they do sell a lot of Jeeps and many of them to oh, the yeah. Chinese, but, um, but uh, it was a great move for Fiat and it was, and it, it was saved Chrysler. So, and, and their sales just go up and up and up. Um, you know. What I like about the move for Ralph is, you know, go back a few years ago, he was also running Dodge right. and Chrysler design. Right. You know, Sergio loves to give everybody two jobs and then that didn't quite work, so they put him in charge of SRT, and then I guess they decided we're not going to have SRT as a standalone brand. And so, to me, it's so great to see Ralph, who is a real design talent, take over design for the entire group. I, yeah, and he, I mean, he brings a passion that's, like, palpable. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, when, when they introduced the, the new Viper, you yes. could just see almost tears in his eyes as they popped the cover on the new Viper. So he brings a passion that... You know, I think it's, it's just going to be great for the brand, which is obviously going to be great for the company. And, and certainly the Chrysler 300, which he's credited with styling, is, is you know, it's it's kind of a, a modern design icon. It, it was, you know, a lot of cars are still aping it. You know, you see elements of it even in the Continental, mm -hmm. I thought. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, very much so. So Chrysler sales were up for the last month, and Joe, I think they say this is like 60 consecutive six, months. Yeah, the 60th straight month. Yeah, are, are, are they, they pulling fast ones here, or, they, or is, is this a legitimate well, increase? They, they've got some pretty aggressive incentives uh, in the marketplace, but Jeep was a real powerhouse in the market, and they only sold about 1,000 Renegades. So 
Renegade. That's only just, just getting going. Yeah, it's just starting. Yeah. The and their sales were up 25% yeah. with only a right. thousand right. Renegade. How, right. how is, how, it was going up even when they didn't have Cherokees. Right, you know, right. Oh, yeah. And it was, it is, like even it's more. amazing. And, and you also, you know, they were starting from a pretty low place. So they're probably the first 36 months were just like, you know, coming back from flat, complete flatline. But but it's true. It is incredible. And but the new Grand Cherokee has just been a flat-out runaway hit. It's a home run. And so yeah. was a Cherokee, and I, you know, people didn't think it would be, but I, and I the knew it was. Headlights. Day everybody one, hated I, the headlights. I, 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 I got to tell you, when I when I came to New York here earlier this week, I decided I'm just going to walk down Fifth Avenue, you know, because this is the big city, you know, and I don't get to experience it that much. I saw more Jeep Rubicons parked on yep. Fifth Avenue than I've seen anywhere else in the world. Yep. What's that about? Well, you know, Jeep is aspirational for everybody. It's it's global, and I don't even think they've tapped that by any stretch. No, they're not done um, yet. There's a lot of potential there, but it's it, it, and we see it in our studies. It's very aspirational for young buyers. It's aspirational for older buyers. It's it just cuts across. But this so is many. the Rubicon. I These know. had full roll cages. Yeah. They had winches. They had fire extinguishers. And I mean, it was the full boat Rubicon. You know, for the Rubicon Trail, and of course, the streets here. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're pretty rough. I think a lot of pre people persuade themselves that they need it because the streets are so rough. And, you know, it certainly as a, a pro image projection device. Yes. There's, there's very little like it. Although I was amused at the show to see the first Range Rover that's really breaking the $200,000 barrier, <laughs> the uh, SV uh, Autobiography, yeah. which is... Um, What's that about? I missed that. The it, most luxurious Range Rover ever made. Yeah, you know, Range Rover, who were also going gangbusters, they're the engine of, of Jaguar Land Rover's profitability. Um, was, you know, they were selling more and more of them, but, you know, they were sort of mired in like 110, 120, 30 thousand dollars. And suddenly, you know, uh, there's a Bentley SUV coming, a Lamborghini, a Rolls Royce. And, you know, the, uh, you can see that there's a, a, a big enough market uh, for luxury SUVs that they could get more money. And so they filled it with as much content as, as possible. And it's, it's quite luxurious. I mean, it's insane inside. But um, my feeling is, is that they probably are thinking that they shot low again, that where's the $300,000? No kidding. Rate? They're, they're going to come up with something because it's like, what are, what are we doing here? Why are they going to come? The Rolls Royce SUV is going to, you know, crest $400,000. You know, like, what are we doing selling a $200,000 car when the Queen drives their car and we could get more money for them? Look at Mercedes pricing on the G60, what is it, 65, uh, I think? It's like yeah. $225,000. And, you know, like, there's no, there's no top. It's hey, incredible. A brand that we should talk about because it introduced two new cars at the show at the exact opposite end of the spectrum is Scion. They have this IM and this IA. I think the IA starts in 16 and change. Right. Joe, is this going to do it for them, though? Because when you come out, when you look back to when Scion launched, it looked pretty, pretty good, pretty damn good. They had pretty solid sales, and now it's like nowhere. They were great, you know, fun vehicles. And I, you'd see people driving around in an XB. You know, a guy that's like 55, 60 years old, maybe he's got a ponytail, happy as a clam driving along in this. But that was the wrong guy right. that they were aiming at. So right. we'll see whether... Although my son drives one, so... Oh, wow. <laughs> right. Well, what do you think, Michelle? Is this going to finally get Scion back on track? You know, New product always helps. It helps, and uh, the one looks pretty good. The one has a, the, the uh, let's see, the IA kind of has a funny Real? looking... Front. I Real. like that one actually. Do you? Yeah, they say it's, it's very polarizing. Oh, I would say but, that that's But that's true. the one I like because I thought the I am, which I guess we're going to have to pronounce I'm, uh, you know, uh, I'm in favor of that one. <laughs> but it looked very Yaris to me. Yeah. Uh, sonic y yeah. to me. But I think they were a classic case of, well, they didn't, they didn't understand the youth market. They ended up developing something that had a very loyal following they were, that had some young buyers, but a, as Joe was saying, that it, it attracted an old audience. And then they really broke faith with their audience who were buying again they were they could afford many of them could afford something else but they wanted a simple cheap car that was without pretense and was kind of funky looking and then you know so what did they do they go uh, so, you know they saw I think they sold like 190,000 cars their first couple of years they're yeah, selling, they were up there and um, and then they introduced a car that got 
was big, bigger, like seven to nine hundred pounds heavier, got you know palpably worse gas mileage, and so they basically all the core values they threw out the window, and they said, well, you know, our research showed us that people wanted a bigger car that got worse worse gas mileage or something, um, and uh, in fact. It wasn't the people who were buying them before, and they didn't because their sales went right. down. So, right. so to the extent that, you know, I think they, the marketing was very muddled, the product planning was super muddled. It's not clear to me just looking at those cars that they've that they've, that they've right it right. It's less muddled. Yeah, that they've righted the the cart, you know. Mm -hmm. But you know, I'll say this about Toyota: they never give up. They you know. never give up. And they, they can afford to do it. And, well, yeah, boy, can they ever. But you know, if you look at the evolution of their minivans until they, they finally really got to the Sienna that they mm -hmm. have today, I, I think most, uh, certainly the American companies would have given up probably first generation, just yeah. went, whoop, we can't do this. <laughs> and same with their pickup, you know, they, they kept growing it. So it'll be interesting, do they have that same stick to itness with a brand that only exists in the U.S. market? I keep wondering where's the little, some little SUV, micro compact SUV that sort of lifts it up, you know, gets, gets after that particular type of customer. From Scion? From Scion. Yeah. yeah. Even now, if it's only another two inches of ride height. That, that's, it, 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 would see, it would seem that within the company that Scion is treated differently. Because usually, uh, as you, you rightly point out, Toyota, you know, you see each generation gets a little better, a little better, and they, they dial in on that sweet spot, like the Camry, you know, like they just kept getting more and more like what people wanted. Uh, Scion, they, you know, they went off the rails, and I, I you know, I don't, I, it doesn't seem like they really know what they're trying to do um, with it. You know, they're certainly capable and qualified to do anything in the world, but they, it just doesn't seem like they have a clear picture of what they're doing in mind. Yeah. I think you got to put Akio on the case and see if he can, you know, infuse. He some said that was a priority. When major came enthusiasm in. into into the portfolio. Speaking of small cars, have you guys seen the the new Smart Four Two? I have not. I did last you did? night at the what, Mercedes what party. Um, it's definitely an improvement, but it would be well, hard. That's it. <laughs> it would not hard, be. hard not to. <laughs> exactly. Uh, that is not saying. Much. I'm so low. Everything looks up. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, it's interesting, and I, I, I can't wait to drive it really. Because it being uh, somebody who drives a lot in New York, I love small, really small cars. It's so fun to drive up and park in front of the place where all your friends who happen to bring cars are like, like desperately looking for parking spaces or spending sixty bucks to park their car. Um, so really, the. Um, Minis got too big. They used to be that, but they're not anymore. Uh, the Fiat 500 is my current champion, except for the smart car. Other than that, with the first generations, there was not. There was no, absolutely nothing to recommend them, except that they said, "Well, I'm, I'm, you know, you know, marching to the beat of my own drummer, and and uh, I, I'm, you know, unpretentious, but, but." Well, show you know, off about it. Talk about car companies that don't give up. I'm stunned that. Daimler has stuck with the smart yes. brand. What, what's it now? Twenty years that it's been out, and it's never made a it. dime yeah. for them. Never a dime, but they won't give up. And now this new one's based on the, the Renault Twingo platform, right? right? Yeah. So they'll get some cost sharings there that they didn't have on the prior design. And and if this thing drives well, maybe it will finally pay off for them. It could, and I think it, you know probably even if they just get back to their first year of selling twenty five thousand a year, it, it, it'll have done its job for them. Which I think is, um, um, you know, it's an image thing as well. I mean, in in fairness, they did spend a lot of money to acquire Smart, and they lost money every year. It wasn't like they were pouring money into developing it very much. So, you know, they 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 were saving money, big time that way. Um, uh, what I'm interested to see, and I still think there's a market out there for, especially as, you know, as, as global warming continues to be an issue and, and, and people want to address that in their car purchases, is where is the hyper luxury um, super mini, you know, and uh, um, Aston Martin had a, a try at that, which I think was a great idea. It was it was flawed in the, the execution because it looked an awful like a uh, an IQ uh, Toyota, which is what it was based on. But um, I think that there really is that kind of um, rich person city car. You know, pe people will buy it. You know, um, uh, under the right set of done right, done right, done right, and, which and is a huge investment because you don't. You know, 
you, you can't just make it the way you can make um, a, a Ferrari show car. It's really a lot of intensive engineering to make something so small and make it really good and luxurious. So, um, so that's no doubt is what's keeping it from us. But uh, I, I, I want that day to come too. Yeah. Okay, final thoughts. We got to wrap this up. Michelle, what, final thoughts of the New York Auto well, Show? Well, it was an impressive show. I thought it had a lot of substance. Luxury was the big theme. Um, I hadn't been here in a year or two, a uh, couple shows, and so I was really impressed. Big crowds of uh, media people, so I, impressive show. Yeah, Jamie, your thoughts? Um, industry seems prosperous, um, and uh, they're, they're trying some interesting things. There's, uh, you know, it's clear that they love to chase the big money, and that's, you know, probably the biggest takeaway for me is that there are sure a lot of big money to chase, you know. Yeah, Joe, your observations? Well, you know, the industry's doing very well. We're, we're on the way, on our way back. Uh, profitability is really good for, you know, almost across the board. You know, we still have the the, the profit drivers of SUVs and, and big pickup trucks, but, you know, it's clear the number of introductions at the show and a lot of excitement at the show. We didn't see a lot of that in the, last, in the prior couple of years. So this has been a big year. The other thing that I, I walk away from the show is starting to get a better sense of the cadence, not of product planning, but of auto shows. Because I know a number of automakers were thinking, geez, the next big show in the United States is late November in LA. And so we've got this huge gap. And they actually pulled product forward that they probably really would have rather waited a little bit but this is how the, the you know the auto show cadence goes. Right. So it's not just a product cadence. It's how do you bring this out uh, to the market? It's a marketing cadence. It is. Keep, it is. Keep the excitement. But I like at the, a boil. I love being here. <laughs> I think the Big Apple is a fun place to be. It is. Thanks for Great coming. Great having the three of you guys. Thank you, Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, okay. really appreciate it. Want to thank all of you for having tuned in and join us again next week for AutoLine After Hours. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by. Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Henkel, excellence is our passion. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live. Get your daily news fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There is all that and much more at Autoline.tv.